I think I got you now. There we go. I think I can hear you now. Perfect. Perfect. How are you, mate? Sin, nice to meet you. Nice um, to meet yeah, you. can you hear me okay? Yeah, perfect. Perfect. Sounds okay, good. Good, good. Good. Well, it's nice it... to uh, meet you with the advances of technology that we've got these days. It's beautiful. What time is it over there? I know it's wild. Uh, it's seven thirty. It's seven thirty p.m. I've uh, I've knocked off from work. You know, just a couple of okay. couple of bevies, but um. Yeah, nice. it's, it's funny. It's the, the time difference. Yeah, how's your how's your morning going? Like start well. Unfortunately, as it's half nine in the morning here, I haven't had any bevies yet. But Mate, you know, it's Friday, so you've got so, permission. You've got my permission. Well, exactly. They always say you know it's too it's too early to drink, don't they? But they, someone says you know it's five o'clock somewhere. So you know exactly in Australia. <laughs> get on it. What's happening? How's um? Where are you? You're you're in the UK at the moment. Where where exactly are you? So I'm in a, a very uh, uh, how can I describe it? Interesting uh, town called Coventry, where I've resided for forty three long years of my life, um, and oh, wow. aiming to not make it forty four. So based on that description, <laughs> should tell you everything. Wow! Wow! Nice! Nice! Well, it sounds great. <laughs> sounds. Do I look okay? Is this framed all right? I've got some weird thing here, but I'm trying to just lean the camera on a thing and yeah, no, no, you've got me right looks good man looks oh, good go. i'm loving the uh yeah, back to the future poster it's uh i gotta i gotta say it's one of my favorite movies of all time <laughs> um yeah i think it might be i always argue with myself about um which one is my favorite and that's that's yeah. certainly up there it's hard for someone like me to have one favorite <laughs> movie it's 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 up there man yeah definitely it's insane do you do you prefer that one uh as opposed to the sequel uh, part two oh, of course yeah the first one's the best you know they gradually sort of descend yeah. into um they they, they they get i don't want to say worse as they go along but the first one's best second one's not as good as the first one so it's not as good as the second one yeah but you know, as a package you know they're beautiful it's a great trilogy and it works and but that first one was just um just unbelievable it's got all of the um everything what i always loved about or what I, what I admire and love about time travel movies is that obviously you know in movies certainly me i'm always looking to how i can manipulate the narrative and 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 um, play with that and you know once you implement time travel into film you do you know tarantino did that with pulp fiction without implementing time travel mm. but i think with, with narrative structure, you know, certainly me, I'm always looking to do that. And I think oh, since I watched that movie when I was like eight or ever, yeah, I just yeah. um, came obsessed with time travel and movies. So it's kind of my it's perfect funny. movie, really. It's perfect. It's funny. When I was uh, younger, I loved uh, part two. Then as I got older, I think I started appreciating part one a lot more. Yeah. And they say that it's like, well, like the perfect script like ever made or something like that. Well, that's it. That's the thing, you know, it's got, it, yeah. it's got its, um, it's got its setups. It's got its payoffs. Um, mm. It's it's got everything you want in terms of, of narrative and character development, and you know, mixed in there with you know great special effects and you know uh, uh, the 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 tropes of you know what what we all want from a Hollywood movie. Yeah. Um, it's imper- well, no no movie's perfect, but in terms of that as a screenplay, uh, you can't help but admire you know what they've what they've done with that. So yeah, yeah no, I love that. I'm a big Fair fan enough. of that. Good. For- it's awesome. It'll be weird. It's like mine. It's a property that like you almost don't want them to remake. But it'll be interesting to see what they could do with it. You know. But do you know what know. property is a property you kind of don't want them to see remake because based on evidence, remakes are really very good. Um, I was very dubious yeah. about the Blade Runner sequel slash remake. Well, it's a sequel, isn't it? The Blade Runner one. Well, I think that's one of the few that they've made recently. They're really honoured the original source material and um, they gave you something fresh and new with the technology that we've got today um but at the same time um you know had a fresh spin on it and i think that's what we all want from you know i, I, I won't i won't get you wrong I, I love the idea of seeing modern retelling of my favorite movies mm. um but it seemed like blade runner you know the, the, the latest blade runner movie was kind of the only example of what i've seen of of the way to go uh, mm. that i can think of off the top of my head i'm sure there are maybe others but you know you look at things like you know the the the, the robocop one uh, i think it was red dawn mm. um ghostbusters you know the, the 
that, that Hollywood doesn't seem to be learning that it's just not happening. And all of these have, you know, more majority, most of them have failed financially and in terms of you know audience popularity. So they don't seem they seem to just want to keep trying. Yeah. For every for every Blade Runner, there's you know ten Ghostbusters. Unfortunately, with these remakes, but uh, it's just yeah. an opinion. It's yeah. it's easier to kind of just remake something and give like an original story a chance. Um, they keep yeah. Down. But having said that, you know that that the, the Ghostbusters Afterlife, I am excited about. Um, mm. I think that's got something going on. Um, it feels again very, I don't know, I want to say respectful to the original. Um, and who knows? I mean, yeah. all trailers look great, don't they? So until <laughs> we see when it comes out, that one does look. That one does look better yeah so um, yeah I'm, I'm i mean you know they've got the, they've got the whole thing in there where it's kind of it's egon's granddaughter isn't it and um mm. i think they're going to link it more to that original ivan uh reitman uh, piece and with him obviously being involved in it i mean who knows what what if you're going to do it i think that's how you do it i suppose and yeah. it's got a bit of a stranger things vibe as well because everybody knows that They've paying, you know, been paying homage to the Ghostbusters throughout those, um, those, you know, right. three seasons so far. So, yeah, fingers crossed, man. Fingers crossed. Yeah, it looks like a good one. Looks like a good one. Yeah. Well, uh, Stephen, um, thanks for joining me, man. I'm really excited to get, have a chance to speak to you. Um, looks like you've had a really interesting journey. Um, I wanted to like, yeah, open it up, I guess, with um, what, obviously you've done a bunch of films. Um, you know, notable ones: Vendetta, uh, Twelve Rounds, Three Lockdown, Interrogation, and Adam Echo as well. But I want you to take me back, you know, back before all of that happened, right? <laughs> Way back. Um, how did you kind of, you know, get into film directing and where did you kind of begin? Yeah, yeah. This is a long story, man. For those of you who uh, want a longer version, I can already tell you there's a TEDx talk out there on YouTube. Go and watch that. It says it all. But um, um, in, in, a, in a nutshell... Um, I just all I, I grew up and I, I just I've always loved movies. You know, it's it, there's a there's a simple and a very comp, uh, uh, convoluted version of this story. But the simple version is, um, yeah, I just always loved movies. And um, you know, growing up in Coventry, which is a kind of drab post-industrial town with not much to do, you know, I was I was a big fan of sort of escapism and escaping into other realms. You know, a big fan of video games and 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 more so movies and TV shows. Grew up watching, you know, TJ Hooker and Street Hawk and Airwolf, The A Team, Hardcastle and McCormick. You know, the list is is, is endless. But um, that was it. Loved the idea of just you know escaping into this round for ninety minutes or or two hours, and and it was a world that same with comics and you know animation and um, and again video games. It's it's the place that doesn't exist in reality. It's where you go to experience things that don't happen in reality. Um, you know, and growing up watching things like Predator and Robocop and Aliens. Certainly in the 80s, there was a massive um, sci-fi movement. Um, and that was a phenomenal thing to see. Um, and that's where it all really spawned from. And then as I got, uh, my, my imagination also was, was wild. I had a wild imagination when I was a kid and I needed sort of an outlet um for all of this chaos in my head so um uh when i was supposed to be revising for my exams you know my teenage years i just sat down and wrote all these novels just just didn't really understand movie making at that point but understood you know anyone can pick up a pen and start writing mm -hmm. so um that's what i started doing and churned out like six novels in a year um all handwritten these manuscripts they're on the that, somewhere up there behind me and um and uh yeah, it kind of then went from there. And then, um, again, films like Back to the Future, Ghostbusters, we just talked about. Um, I, I love the idea of create. I didn't understand, like I said, I didn't understand camera, set up, directing, post-production. Um, I didn't understand any of that. I um, was never around it. And so um, just wrote these novels. But then I think that grew. And then I was about 16, 17. Um, and I was, I was watching a lot of Tony Scott movies you know, Top Gun, Days of Thunder, um, Found True Romance, Crimson Tide, all that er early era Tony Scott. And I've, I've never seen a director who could frame and and um, shoot the way he did in terms of colour and editing. Um, he was a pioneer, man, and um, RIP. And also, and also what I come to learn was a British director as well who'd gone over to Hollywood 
to kind of shake things up a little bit with him and his older brother Ridley, as we know from Blade Runner and Alien, Gladiator. And um, so I started to then kind of warm towards what's what's directing them. This seems to be what I like, painting these pictures, these visuals, then I started to move away from the words. Um, and then uh, um, 1995, I went to watch a movie at the cinema called Bad Boys, <laughs> directed by Michael Bay. Awesome. <laughs> and um, and it's uh, yeah yeah and when I came out it had all of the flavors of what you know Tony Scott was doing but almost on steroids um, and I, that's how I always describe Michael Bay you know a uh, little bit more style over content believe it or not even on Tony uh, at least he would kind of you know explore character and narrative but you know Michael Bay is just feels like um, certainly in the later years you know that Tony Scott flavor but just um, Right. Um, but I did come out like it was an assault on these senses. And I was like, whatever that is, the car chaser, you know, at the end with the Porsche and the Cobra, I was like, I want to do that. That's how I felt watching that scene. I want to do that, man. I want to give that back to audiences. And then an even longer story cut short, kind of, I was working very menial jobs at that point, went through into my 20s. Mm. And just, just, you know, I don't really have any education. So I was just driving forklift trucks around warehouses. And um, I essentially was still writing. If I couldn't f film things, I was writing. But I hadn't really filmed anything at that point until I kind of saved up some money. Um, bought myself a camera and um, kind of self taught, taught myself camera and um, how to oh, shoot wow. and, and, and films myself. And then just went from there really. There's, again, another life story from there to mm. then where I am, I guess, which, you know, we can go into at some point, but that's kind of the, the catalyst, the beginning of, you know, where it all, yeah. where it all kind of, became, I guess. Yeah. That's yeah. awesome. I guess like, yeah. it's interesting that, um, you know, a lot of people grow up in these, you know, either smaller towns and things like that. And you kind of like, you have this love. I mean, me personally as well, like I grew up overseas, first of all, like in Eastern Europe and then, came to Australia and so like that and you live in like you know one of these cities and you're like thinking well being an actor or being like a director or being anything it's like that's out of reach completely yeah <laughs> and it's, yeah it's funny oh, that, well, huge, yeah. yeah hugely it was it was it was beyond I don't know it was, it, it was beyond thinking I suppose from there you know you grow up in LA or London and you, you know you kind of certainly Vancouver mm. you know which where I shot one of my movies, there's a big filmmaking community there. And it's not unheard of. It's not unrealistic to know that, you know, your friend of a friend yeah. made it big or, you know, got a screenplay optioned. You would hear it more, but from, you know, smaller, more, I want to say ordinary towns, you know, where what you're supposed to do is, you know, go to school, get your education, go to university, get a stable job um and and you know that happens and that's great and that's what some people want but I never I always knew what I didn't want to be and it was that you know I didn't want to go to university yeah. um um which I ended up doing because I listened to someone and took their advice about going to uni and then I you know did four months there and got out of there very quickly because I knew it wasn't for me <laughs> um but that's that's you know the way like, you know, everyone lives their life differently I just kind of had an idea of what I wanted to do I always wanted to make movies or be in an industry that was a little bit different whether it be you know through camera editing writing cinematography um it was always a world that fascinated me and I always loved the idea of not actually having a a, a real job you know they always say find find a, a or, you know what's the, the there's a saying isn't there find a career you love yeah. or you enjoy or, or turn your hobby into a job and you'll never work a day in your life yeah and that always appealed to me um, because the menial jobs that I did have, you know, made me very miserable. And, you know, I fell into depression many a time because I knew the life I wanted to lead. But um, I, I, I was so far away from that. Um, and I even get moments like that now still, because there's, you know, a, 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 there's still a bigger picture for me and where I am isn't, you know, where I, where I want to be really. But yeah, that was, that was tough. So yeah. Yeah, it was that was made it even tougher, really, because you know you tell people what you want to do, and they're like, "Well, no, yeah. carry on that thing." Nice. You're doing. It's and, a nice dream. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's not, it's nice, hobby, Steve, but you know, let's be realistic here. No, okay. Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> well, what was uh, what was your fuck it moment when you were like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, ch- I'm gonna chase this? Um, I've always been a pretty stubborn, resilient motherfucker, and um, and uh, I, I, I don't think it was ever one real moment. Yeah, it was just the 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 more that I fantasized or thought about this potential dream coming reality becoming reality it kind of just fueled me spurred me on um and i guess i just wanted to keep creating i enjoyed it yeah i uh, never really knew if it would take me anywhere uh, but i knew i enjoyed it and i knew that as long as i was creating i was creating opportunity or possibility at least if i'm making something i'm in the game um, but if I'm not making anything, I'm not in it at all. Right. Whereas at least if I'm making stuff, even, you know, and a lot of the stuff I've made isn't very good. But I was always creating and always learning. Um, and I guess, the, I, I, I suppose the turning point, it was more of a turning point, I guess, was I'd finished this fan film that I had self-financed called Tomb Raider Ascension many moons mm-hmm. ago. And I finished that and I was like, I, I, you know, you know I kind of there's been times in my life where I've had like a wake up moment mm. um, or a bit of an epiphany and you go nah I'm not I'm going down the wrong road here and I kind of regroup I'm doing it now I regroup and I kind of start again and I come away from Tomb Raider Ascension and I was like nah this isn't this isn't something's off here and so I went back and uh, penciled this kind of a little bit more of a gritty grimy uh, more faithful to reality um, short film called Snowman, which is about this uh, uh, vigilante, but he was he was an albino, mm. um, and it kind of felt a little bit more kind of like Unbreakable in that you've got this kind of quasi superhero element, but not really. Um, he's not really got any superpowers. It kind of looks a bit mythical, you know. Um, but it was it was you know it was drenched in reality. He was a very ordinary guy going out. Um, he was he was attacked. He was constantly bullied as a child and stands up for himself, trains himself in martial arts, goes out and finds the bad guys. It's a common trope, but um, I explored that. And the long story short, that's kind of um, what drew the producer's attention, the guy that produced Vendetta, right. uh, Jonathan Southcott. It, it, you know, he, he, I sent this to him um, through many of the emails that I send out to mm-hmm. people to try and connect and let them know. I'm here that I still do today. And um, and um, he saw it and he, kind of, he liked it, but wanted to kind of reshape it a little bit and turn it into Vendetta. And that I think that was that was a huge turning point. You know, if I hadn't made Snowman, who knows, um, you know, where this, this journey would have taken me. So I guess that's a turning point rather than, right, fact, I'm going to do it. Yeah. But that, that was always there with me. As I got older, as soon as I could, you know, afford a camera, I went and bought one. You know, as soon as I had the confidence to make movies, I didn't have a lot of confidence in my teenage years. And then once that started to get my confidence back a little bit in my twenties, it was all very gradual. But that was that was a huge turning point um, with Snowman and Vendetta. That's awesome. I watched uh, I watched Vendetta last night. Actually, I really liked it. Um, I haven't seen like I haven't seen Danny Dyer like in a in a little while. Like I remember watching him, you know, like Football Factory and all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, right. And I guess yeah, that, was, yeah. that was a movie that kind of um, kind of brought him back a little bit into the limelight, wasn't it? What was that experience yeah. like? And I guess, I mean, it's your first feature film as well. So take me through a bit of that, you know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's funny. I was thinking about this the other day and I, I, I watched some of the behind the scenes documentaries and I'm watching this 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 guy um, um, in this interview, this very kind of um, uh, uh, overconfident young director uh, uh, putting his spin on how he was going to approach this movie, and I'm like, so I, had, I had big balls back then, man. Like that was my first movie, and and I, it's like I'm like listening to this guy talk, and I'm like, that just that doesn't sound like me, man. I don't know if I lost my confidence again in my balls or something. But this guy's got it going on. Um, yeah, I kind of went in there. Um, uh, I don't know if it was false confidence or to 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 try and make everyone believe that I you know, was, was, was fully, you know, confident that this would, uh, this movie would be good. I didn't know that. You never know that when you, when you're shooting a movie, but uh, I knew that 
yeah, it's, it, was, it, was, it was just weird for me to watch this guy, but it's a different kid. Uh, I say kid, it's like six years ago, seven years ago, but um, um, it was a great experience. I believed in the script. I knew that Jonathan Southcott believed in me as a producer, and that's always a great help going forward. Um, and I knew Danny believed in me, but more importantly, I, I made sure that Danny had faith in me as a director. Right. Because I didn't know what I was, I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know what I wanted from the movie, and I got what I wanted um, from everybody um, because um, from writing the script. This is why I'm a much better filmmaker when I'm writing my screenplays and then I'm directing them. I'm already quite confident that you know, obviously, you've written the script and it's been options and someone wants to make it, so your confidence is already up. Whereas if you get pulled, well, certainly for me, if I get pulled in to direct someone else's movie. I'm kind of, I'm, I feel like I'm going in very cold, very right. new. Um, I haven't proven myself mm. um, to this project yet until my first day on set. Whereas I think when you've written something and directed it, you've kind of proved, especially if they like the screenplay, that you've got a little bit going on already. Um, and so, you know, if you then carry that then on, on to the, you know, into the post-production, uh, pre-production, um, um process yeah and then eventually on set people kind of have a little bit more faith and belief in you and confidence in you and i'm like a sponge so yeah. if i'm in a room and everyone's adrenalized and nervous i'll end up being nervous right. um and if 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 everybody's cool and calm and confident and you know they they then i'll feed off that um so that uh, there was there was just there was a confidence in me from the beginning whether i gave that off or whether i fed off that who knows? It's kind of reciprocal, I guess, that kind of um, um, yeah. that kind of process. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, the first time I sat down with Danny, to me, he was a big star. He's a huge star, still is. Yeah, uh, very famous guy. You know, he's super famous, Danny. He's a household name, and <laughs> certainly in the UK, no matter where you go, you know, he'll get yeah. recognised. Um, and so, for me, it was nerve wracking because I'm working with a star. I don't know how he's going to behave. Is he going to be difficult? I'm. I, he knows it's my first feature. Some actors can be a little bit. They can play up a little bit, you know, if they know that you're new and you're a bit green to it all. Um, and I've kind of experienced a little bit of that with with some of the people and projects that maybe haven't happened. So mm. I was I was wary that that could be a possibility, but not at all. One of the most down to earth, um, uh, respective um receptive um um actors i've ever worked with um and we sat down and had this lunch <laughs> i was going to then kind of pitch how we were going to do the project he had read the script he already loved the script so again like i said before great start for me yeah. um whereas you know like i said you go into meetings where you haven't written it they're like so who the fuck are you then <laughs> yeah whereas the other way around it's lovely i read your script mm. it's great Okay, good start. Yeah, it's a good platform. And he was he was lovely. And you know, I said to him, I want to what what I want to do with you on this one, Danny. I said, you know, I want to, and I've always liked the idea of this, um, is to take a character or an actor like Danny, who is kind of renowned for doing a specific type. He's typecast, really, you know, right, he's pigeonholed, yeah. being a certain character, playing a certain role. So I was like, what I want to do is do something different. You know, I want to take a character and, I, and I, you know, if I work with Jason Momoa, I'd probably ask him to fucking shave his head, yeah. you know, because, you know, what let's take what they're renowned for. And I really just want to um, show the or show them to the audience in a completely different light. Right. Um, and that was what I wanted to do with Danny. Unfortunately, he wouldn't shave his head. But, uh, <laughs> um, um, yeah, I said, you know, we're going to do some training with these SAS guys. SAS fellas who I, I I know and you know we're going to really get you into the mindset of what it's like you're never going to be full on you know no one's ever going to buy you a hundred percent as a you know SAS yeah, yeah. Uh, regiment <laughs> lad um, but we can give you some of the tools that will help you behave that way a little bit um, right. so that we're kind of you know at least it, the, oh, this, the least we can do yeah. So, you know, I, was, I gave him like a, 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 a kind of fake firearm 
to play with and do like mag changes with, and he was can sleeping with it under his pillow. And I was like, I really want to go where we can. Let's go into the mindset of who this guy is. Um, that excites me. And yeah. I know I know that if I'm an act, if I was an actor, which I was when I was younger, that's how I sort of thought I was going to get into movies before I understood writing. I wanted to act. I wanted to be Martin McFly. I had the body warmer and the the trainers and the skateboard and everything, oh, the denim right. jacket. But uh, yeah, that's that's there's a picture of me somewhere. It's horrendous. And um, so um, I understand, you know, or try and understand what excites actors and try and galvanise them, you know, going forward into 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 my projects. And I knew that would really help him out. And it worked, you know. Some, I've spoke to, you know, some of the SAS guys that you know I still speak to now, and they're like, he's always going to be Danny Dyer. But sometimes you can see what you've done. You've made him a bit moodier. He talks less. Uh, you know, you speak to these special forces guys. And this, in my experience anyway, maybe people will tell you something else. They're very, very humble. You know, they don't, they, they, they're, they're, they're not verbose. They just kind of sit and watch the room and don't tell you that they've killed, you know, however many people they have. And, um, and then that they could break your neck in your sleep um, and no one would know. They're very humble in that. So uh, there, there was an element of that, I think, with, with Danny and Vendetta. And, and also it was uh, it was basically my homage to Punisher. It was basically yeah. a Punisher movie. Vendetta. <laughs> in a way, oh, yeah. There you go, yeah. Yeah, yeah. There but, uh, yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. That's crazy. Um, well, that's that's what I noticed. Like a lot of, you know, it's your first feature film. A lot of great action scenes, a lot of stunts. Um, you know, the way the the bad guys are killed are absolutely brutal. Like the the torture. It's like, you know, how do you come in there? How do you come into this first film? How much support do you have? I guess to shoot these scenes, or do you use your past experience that you kind of know how to go about it? Or you know, what was the support level like on this first film? <laughs> Do you mean in terms of um, how choreography, I guess? Or... Yeah, I guess like, yeah, either blocking the scenes out, choreography, yeah, yeah. Um, the training, like you mentioned, the SAS guys for the actors. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, well, I mean, um, I guess um, in terms of um, some of the, the, well, I say some of the action, there's not a lot of action in, in Vendetta. There's one shootout kind of in this apartment or flat, as we call it. And um, yeah. that was... I, I I pretty much cho I choreographed that. So I choreographed that. Then there's a big kind of um, semi heist sequence where the guys are in the bunny outfits yeah. and bunny masks. And that, when you know, when I think about it, what's really weird is, and I'm sure we'll get to this when I went over to Vancouver to do the bigger movies. You know, obviously I had an entire stunt coordinator team, right? Right. With with stunt doubles and etc. Vendetta was so sort of low budget and you know almost guerrilla filmmaking at times I did a lot of that but kind of unknowingly because I'd come from a background of, of just producing and making all of my own movies anyway yeah when it came to devising certain sequences like the shootout in the apartment and the you know the heist where they you know um rob rob the girl in the um underpass yeah. Uh, yeah, I devised all of that and I blocked all of that through. And I think we had one sort of stunt guy. He was more of a safety. Um, on the days he wasn't fight choreographer, because we had a Krav Maga guy come in called Nick Mason, who was brilliant at sort of teaching some just... Because mm. Danny's never going to be fucking John Wick, you know? <laughs> but I was like, we need, to just, we need quick clinical, boom, snap. Yeah, and Krav's very good at that sort of yeah. just very quick clinical blows, boom, you're off. Yeah, you know, and um, and I've known Nick for years, so I got Nick in for that. But then on days where maybe someone needed to just be on set to make sure that people weren't getting hurt, and um, he'd he'd be there. But I, yeah, I pretty much choreographed all of that. The the, the guy getting pulled in half with the car. What I always yeah. knew is that we didn't have a lot of money to see mm. what we were going to see. Um, and obviously you go back to movies like, like Jaws and Spielberg lent into the fact that you can't see the shark. Why not? Because it looks terrible. <laughs> not for any other reason other than it looks terrible. So we see the fin, we see it from far away, yeah. you know, and he really leaned into that and to its absolute strength, you know, it's made the movie. Yeah. 
what it is from the fact of it's what you don't see that scares you more. And I was like, well, I'm going to lean into that then because we haven't got the money to see the guy get pulled in half. Let What can we do? What can we see? Yeah. Um, and I was like, I can see this top shot and we just need to see that, that you know, he's, his ass is on the floor and his <laughs> you know, chained, hands are chained, his feet are chained. But we need to see that. Yeah. How, you know, how do we see that? We're going to put a box under, we're going to CGI it away. No, da, 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 you know. So I was like, well, we do that from a top shot. And, you know, we put the box underneath him. And if the actor's happy for two people at each end, we had a safe word. We had a safe word. And I basically said, you know, we're going to go with the top shot. The guys are going to pull you. Um, and your safe word is whatever it was. Yeah. Um, and he was like, okay. And you could see he was a little bit worried. And I was like, I don't want to put my actors in this kind of you know dangerous situation at the same time we have to play it safe but he was he was a trooper and um yeah that was how obviously we pulled that shot off cement down the throat's pretty easy to do you know you just you you cap off the funnel really and just yeah. pour it in so it doesn't go down the lad's throat but these are all yeah these are all tricks these, these are my my yeah idea and then obviously on the bigger movies you've got entire departments to just think about that shit Mm. Um, and and that's their job, and they but they'd be yeah. better at me than that because then I can then concentrate on directing. But a movie that size with that sort of s- scope, um, you're really coming up with those little things yeah. yourself. There's plenty more I could probably tell you. There was one, but when the guy cracks in with the baseball bat and the blood spills out, I did something clever there um, with, with 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 some framing. Um, uh, yeah, there was there was a lot of little tricks that we it's were doing. You know, it's impressive. Yeah. It's really impressive, especially for like your f- first film. So I was just wondering, like, yeah, how was how did that all play out, and like, how did you approach yeah. it? Oh, that's 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 awesome. That's impressive. Um, cool, man. I had um, another question. I guess um, you know, obviously that time period, you see Liam Neeson comes back to the scene with Taken, and, and he's like this, you know, old school action hero, on a you yeah. know also trying to get payback and everything like that. John Wick as well around that area. How much of that do you think also kind of helped around Vendetta kind of getting made as well around that period of time? Well, I suppose, thankfully, I'm pretty sure John Wick came out just after Vendetta. Yeah. So it it wasn't, that wasn't really an inspiration. Again, uh, you know, my main inspiration for Vendetta was was The Punisher, you know. And I was always a fan of, um, I've always been a fan of revenge movies. Like The oh. Crow is, you know, we talk about Back to the Future being one of my favorite movies. Crow so the good. Crow, it, there's always a battle for my top sort of number one spot and it changes. Yeah. And it's always between kind of Back to the Future, The Crow, and there's about three others. Um, I love The Crow so much. Um, so good. I actually so thought of that as I was watching Vendetta. I actually started thinking about The Crow because I loved it as yeah. well. It's so yeah, good. Yeah, and even leaving little signs here and there, you know, like yeah. three left, and you know that was yeah. a kind of a nod to him leaving the big flaming outline of the crow. It's even from the same angle. That's um, awesome. Yeah. But it was really, yeah, you know, thinking about like, as you say, people, you know, movies like like Taken and um, and and films like that 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 were that had sort of become, I guess he. he they were quite prevalent then from, from Taken. You know, I think, mm. you know, Kevin Costner sort of did a version, awesome. which was called like Three Days or something, which was very cool. Yeah. And it was kind of a reinvention of the older, mm. almost like, you know, something like Get Carter, but yeah. with a very physically fit version of, you know, uh, you know, or, or, a, or a martial arts trained version of Michael Caine. Um, yeah. So, yeah, they, they, they've always been big inspirations. But for me, you know, I think Vendetta is basically my Punisher with Danny Dyer. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. I like that. Yeah. Um, the other actor that I also noticed, I might be pronouncing his name wrong, but is it, is it Joseph Atlan or Yusuf Atlan? Yeah, Joe Atlan, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's yeah. awesome as well. He, like, obviously, he's kind of gone on and done a lot of things, Game of Thrones and, yeah, yeah he he's some pit. promises and stuff, yeah. yeah and what was he, he like? Pit. He was Pip in Game of Thrones, and then he had a, he had a you know kind of bit part in was it Rogue One or, or yeah the last the, the last Jedi Rise of Skywalker. Mm. Um, he is what's fascinating mm-hmm. about Joe is that he all of the guys um, the guys who played the kind of uh, uh, visceral uh, hoodie mm. um, antagonists. Um, were all 
horrible in front of the camera. They were everything. They were everything you don't want to bump into on a dark street in <laughs> Britain. They're ev- they're everything. They're the guys sitting on your wall outside drinking a few cans of Stella that you don't want to tell to move on. They're the guys pulling up to you next to you in the car park with their music too loud, eyeing up your misses. Yeah. They embodied that. In in it, when the cameras stopped rolling, they were the nicest lads <laughs> ever, most respectful, nice, um, nicest lads um, ever. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Josh O'Day, who's the kind of big, um, yeah. uh, 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 what would I say? Kind of is he the he's he's the uh, kind of main. He's not the main. He's he. He's the catalyst. He's kind of the trigger for everything that happens because it's his yeah, brother yeah. that gets. He's the lad yeah. that gets blown up in the car and burnt in the car. I still speak to Josh now, and he he will literally. I went for a, a coffee with him for last year sometime just before the pandemic and everything. Yeah, and um, not just nicest guy ever. And you can't believe that they can turn this on. And that's acting. Mm. That's great acting. That's what you want. You yeah. want people to be. You know, not you don't want people creating an unsettling and easy atmosphere on set because they're staying in character, which I know some actors do, and it's questionable whether they need to do that because <laughs> warrant it that they're acting that right. So, um, um, so they were brilliant, and Joe um, would would turn it on as well. Joe could be just this kind of sneaky, vicious, horrible character, and then you'd go over and direct him. You go, okay, yeah, right. Oh yeah, oh, um, oh yeah. Okay, Steve. Okay, great. You know, like that. And you're like, yeah. how does he do it? <laughs> I wanted to. I, wanted, I was behind the. I was in my monitor a minute ago, and I wanted to kill you because of what you were doing. Um, and um, they were all like that. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah I get it, Steve. Get it. Oh, thank, you know. And they give me a big cuddle. Josh used to pick me up, put me over his shoulder, and nice. walk them all. <laughs> and um, Joe, absolutely brilliant guy. And um, I, I look forward to working with any of those guys um, yeah. any day of the week. Uh, they're awesome, yeah. yeah. I definitely, uh, I definitely grew up with a lot of a uh, lot of guys like that around my my area as well. So I know the I know the types that you're talking about. Yeah, so 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 have I, and so it made it very easy for me to write those. Probably yeah. because at one point in my life I was one of those guys. Unfortunately, right. <laughs> I certainly had attributes. Certainly had attributes similar or very good friends who were very similar. Yeah. Um, and um, yeah, they weren't they weren't too hard for me to write. <laughs> you're used to it um i guess vendetta comes out you got this first feature film what's the next step like is it i'm off i'm, I'm i can make whatever i want now it's like what's the what kind yeah. of happens after vendetta for you uh, that didn't happen I, 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 I didn't really know what to expect um but i, I thought there would be um some movement hmm. and um the, the the short story is I, there wasn't you know, I came back to Coventry, so I'd stay down in London making this movie. Vendetta came out, um, Boxing Day, um, best uh, best selling uh, DVD, straight to DVD in the UK of that year. Um, and um, everyone thought, huge thing, you know, here we go now, here we go, this is it. And um, I kind of stayed semi open minded. I try not to get too excited too quickly. It's hard not to though when you know yeah and that has been so so popular and so well received and kind of cast Danny in a new light, a better light with audiences. And really there was a big positive um movement in terms of how people viewed him after this film. And it's kind of been non-stop for him since, which has yeah. been beautiful. Um I came back to Coventry and just went back to my usual, you know, pick up a camera make corporate films to pay the bills I didn't get paid a lot for vendetta because the budget was so small but i knew oh, that was that mm. you know i would have done i probably would have done vendetta for free yeah dying to make it yeah so it was it, it was cool man i had a bit to live off and uh, carried on you know working away um and what was what was nice was that you know jonathan Softcott, who had produced vendetta then had a big slate of movies that he wanted to make over the next sort of year or 18 months or so. Mm. But he basically, you know, would have, he wanted me to direct pretty much, you know, the majority of them. Yeah. And there was certainly four or five. Um, but they they just, you know, and listen against the, 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 the genre of the films or, uh, but they, they, they just weren't for me. And I read the scripts and I was like, 
I, my instinct is just telling me not to make. I don't want to make these movies. Right. I have to be excited. I have to be really excited about getting on set because when I get on set, I'm 150 percent. Like I, I don't sleep. I'm invested in the movie um, so much that 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 takes a certain level of excitement for me to be fueled to fuel that energy to be able to execute it um yeah faithfully faithfully so none of these were exciting to me and and i probably could have made a lot of money um but that's never motivated me um Mm. and um I, i just couldn't see myself making these films nothing against them uh nothing against the writers that wrote them yeah. Again, maybe that thing of I, I just it's it's not an ego thing. It's not an ego thing of I haven't written that, I'm not making it. Right. It's an intrinsic thing of I haven't written this, I, I can't see it. I, I fucking I, I can't I just I, I'm I, I can have like a you know T eight hundred meltdown <laughs> at the end of T three, like it doesn't fucking compute. I can't, I can't do it, man. I like um, it. Sometimes anyway, but these just were well, I, I couldn't, I was like, nah man. They kept coming through, and I think then soft got got pissed off with me. <laughs> I kept saying no, but I've got to be true to you know my my, my gut man, and, yeah. and I was, and, which is tough to know, do as well. Yeah. Oh, it was hard to do, man, because yeah. I was I was very very quickly broke after Vendetta financially. Right. Um, so I was like, I've got to stick to my guns, man. I've got yeah. to I've got to I can't do. Um. But nothing came from elsewhere. You know, obviously, right. Jonathan had worked with me and it was great. And, you know, he wanted to work with me again, which was lovely. And because we had such a great process and Vendetta was a, a, a wonderful shoot. And um, everyone, you know, truly fell in love with each other. And um, I miss those guys dearly. Um, but but nothing came n- nothing came from anywhere else other than, than Jonathan. And so eventually I went... Um, Here's a fuck it moment for you. Yeah, I have it. Here's there we go. Fuck it. I knew there was a lace um, one. I knew there was. Right. <laughs> I was like, fuck this. I'm going to go to LA. I'd always wanted to go to LA. And, you know, you, you, you see that, that that trope in other movies, small town guy or girl yeah. goes to Hollywood to chase a dream with no money in their pocket. And I was like, <laughs> I, I fucking don't need much of an excuse. I want, I want that to be part of my story in my life because this is a great story so this looked like an excuse to go and do that but you know it, it was it was uh, very much in the in the um justified because yeah i was reaching out to people here as well after right. vendetta i've just made this movie can we sit down and have a coffee i had some horrible responses one guy works on a <laughs> show i'm not going to mention <laughs> i was just like this is how we want to connect and uh, you know, I won't tell you it was, it was a long time ago. Anyway, and he, he went. Um, I've seen your reel, and I'm really busy, and I don't really know what I can offer you by sitting down and have a coffee with you. I was like, oh, oh okay. <laughs> Maybe just say, yeah. All right. Like, oh, all right. All right. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm pleased you're being honest. That's kind of nice. <laughs> just say you too busy, but yeah, just throw it in there. Um, yeah. and I was like, ah, oh, man, so. I just was like, I was looking, I don't know anyone one in LA. And I'm like, right. I kept saying to myself, what am I going to do? Just get off the plane and be like, fucking Terrence Stamp and the limey. Yeah. Like, I'm here. I'm, I'm coming. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what I'm not, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know where I'm going. I don't know anyone. But um, there, were two, there were two things that looked like they were happening. And you'll recognize this name. A writer friend of mine called Niall Kassan. Oh, great guy. He, he he was following me on Twitter and I followed him back and he's from Ireland and um, uh, and he had tweeted about this pitch fest that was happening in LA and I knew all about pitch fest. I literally went to one in London um, for, you know, people watching. It's basically like speed dating, but with your screenplay and mm. you've got five minutes to sit down. There's a room full of chairs and production companies you target your production company, you sit down, you pitch them for five minutes, the ball horn goes, you like fucking cattle, you go <laughs> out the exit, you come back round, it's a bit like during the pandemic, so I was pretty ready for that shit, and then you queue up again, 
and then you go back in to target the one that you want to go and see. Wow. Um, I wild. <laughs> um, I can't pitch movies, so I was right. like, right, <laughs> okay. So I started <laughs> to try and get pretty good at that. Ricky Tick Quick, and um, I'd reached out to Niall, and I said to him, yeah. I said, are you going to this thing? Like, and he was like, yeah, bro. Da, 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 da. I was like. Well, then I'd have a kind of buddy over there because I've been retweeting yeah, him and yeah. sent me the messages and he'd sent me an idea for a film and he'd seen Vendetta. I was like, so that's good. That's good, right? I'm, I'm not booking anything. I'm looking at flights and I'm like, I can't afford this. I ain't got any money. Yeah. And I go, um, I'll say, uh, uh, I go, and then I go back. I'm like, so who do I know in the UK who might know someone in LA? I don't know anyone. And all I knew was Jonathan Sothcart and... Um, uh, a gentleman from uh, Anchor Bay um, and uh, uh, Rod knew the guys over in LA's Anchor Bay right. and set up a meeting with me with them and he was also kind of talking to WWE Studios oh. um, about potential co-pros um, maybe them shooting something over here Right. and there was yeah. dialogue I knew there was a dialogue happening there so he said, I said, look, I'm not asking for a lot. I just want a 20 minute meeting going for a meeting with them. Let them know I'm here. I'm better when I'm in front of someone. I can't pretty crap on the phone. Yeah. I'd rather spend the money and get on the plane and go and meet three people than, you know, have a, have a quarter with them. Right. Um, so, yeah, basically I was like, well, this is all kind of coming together. Three meetings is better than none. Um, and this pitch fest thing sounds interesting. So that's enough, man. And I'll try and get more meetings. And if I don't, these will work. Yeah. So that was it. Yeah, got on a plane, went to LA again. Another big long story cut short. Went into the WWE studios offices, had a twenty minute meeting with their uh, uh, head of development, Richie Lowell, and then um, six weeks later, I was being flown out to Vancouver to shoot twelve rounds three lockdown. So it was it, it, it yeah. It, uh, I don't know if I was lucky or if I was smart or if I was a bit of both. Um, I, if I'd have known I was going into that WWE studios office with the potential of directing, uh, interviewing basically yeah. to direct a $2.5 million action movie with one of their WWE superstars, I may have been a little bit more nervous <laughs> and I may not have got the gig because when I, uh, I'd rather not know and I'm glad I didn't know. Yeah. Um, the pressure. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah, it, it, they liked me, basically. That was what they told me afterwards. <laughs> I was like, what got it done? And they said, well, we saw Vendetta. We could see how you could stretch the dollar and the budget and make things look more expensive than they right. are. You shoot quickly. You shoot efficiently. You're a nice guy. You're in. I was you like, job. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah. 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 So that was it. So, um, yeah, no, it was... Uh, that one came off and obviously met Niall uh, while I was at the pitch fest and we hung out and had a few beers and every time I'm in LA now, if he's there, which he usually is, yeah. um, we, we, we hang out and we, you know, shoot the shit and have a beer yeah. and taco Tuesdays. And uh, <laughs> I, just, oh, I love him. I love that guy, man. Like, yeah, uh, uh, yeah he's a super he's a, cool guy and a very a talented writer as well. Yeah. And there's a screenplay I've read. I can't say too much about it. Unless he did, I don't know. But I'd say he's probably not as well. <laughs> you might have mentioned something um, off air, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so... Um, yeah. Yeah. Is yeah. It, yeah. Good, Niall's the best. Niall's good, the best. <laughs> That's awesome. So I guess you get this chance to do the WWE film and they bring you back, right, for a second time to direct it again with interrogation. Um, so obviously those two films, like you mentioned before, quite a different experience to shooting Vendetta, Vendetta right? Is it more because of the budget and everything that's kind of, obviously it's a US film, WWE, that sort of thing. Um, what was that experience yeah. like with those two films specifically? Well, they play out, what was great about them is they, they play out and they are treated a lot more like a Hollywood studio picture, right. albeit with, with a fraction of the budget. Yeah. But the way it plays out in terms of, you know, pre-production, the, that whole process, the shooting process, the heads of department, how the meetings run was um, very much like I would expect. I've never made yeah. a fucking big 50 
200 million dollar you know action movie picture right. but you know played out a lot more like that in that it was a well oiled machine mm. in terms of how the um vancouver crew and the production manager up there donald monroe who was a phenomenal uh, number crunching um um production manager genius mm. um, um and how that all worked was a learning process for me because i'd never worked like that before and also scary as fuck at times because yeah. I, I i got off a 13 hour flight or something from london to vancouver and i kind of wanted to galvanize my crew and yeah. do that thing of i'm here to work i'm here to fucking so i got off i got off the flight and, and donald picked me up and he said we're going to take you to the hotel you settle in get yourself some sleep he said no is anyone at the production office or is it he's all started working yet yeah yeah we're all there cinematographers there we're all starting to put things together cost uh, ward, uh, wardrobes there you know the first ad's there second ad da, 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 da. production designer so like, oh, i was gonna have a meeting man we'll yeah. do a meet and greet he's like what <laughs> yeah I'm fucking, I'm jet. I don't know what time it is now. I'm in a way. Yeah, you're I'm ready like, to go. Yeah. yeah, let's go, man. Let's go. So I get there, probably looking like this. There you go. Oh, I'm Steve from the UK. I've got bad skin and bad teeth. Well, oh, I know another one. And um, so, uh, yeah, no, it was, it was, it was wonderful. Um, wonderful to to just hit the ground running. I really did. And I think they kind of got that vibe. I wanted to give that yeah. vibe. I'm here to work out. I'm not going to mess about. Yeah. Um, but, I, but I was honest with them. I said, "Look, this is my first one at this 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 sort of scale. It's yeah. much bigger from what I did before, which was almost like an indie guerrilla movie. Right. Um, you guys have worked with each other before. It's going to be weird for me coming in and I'm leading you like I'm yeah. kind of the boss. Right. And I've always said that it's very strange because the majority of the time when I've gone into a movie, everybody on that movie." has had more on set experience than me right. but i'm there to run the show <laughs> and it's an interesting dynamic in that i want to be respectful to them all but at the same time if i'm them you're always the new guy who's coming in telling everyone what to do yeah that is that uh, is must be a strange um um scenario for them yeah true. especially if they don't like you a little bit not everybody likes me and and um, I don't believe that. Oh, I don't believe it for a second either, man. But it's true, man. It's a true story. <laughs> no, and, and that's that's life, you know. Yeah. yeah. As instinct, we want to be liked, and we want everyone to like us. They're fucking not going to, especially me when I get going on a set, and mm. we've got an hour to go, and I've got fucking six pages to shoot or something. <laughs> um, yeah. Someone is not going to like me, and someone's going to get it. Yeah. Um, so. That's fair enough as long as they respect that. If I did that, I would always apologize. I'd always apologize the next day. There was one guy I had a little running with. Mm. So I do, look, you're trying to do your job. I'm trying to do mine. I'm sorry, man. Like, you know, yeah. all, always apologize if, if anyway. Um, and so it was very strange, you know, <laughs> answer to your question, long winded answer to that, to go in. Yeah. And, and, but, but then also exceptionally inspiring because the crew I was given was 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 shit hot and them guys up in vancouver really know how to put things together there's so many things that shoot up there there's so much experience up there um and what we were trying to do with those two movies was phenomenally ambitious um me as a filmmaker i'm always trying not to do another schlocky derivative actioner that people are going to forget about I've probably made two of those, but I know in my heart, I'm always looking to try and do something that's a little bit yeah. different. Um, and, you know, there were, there were times where it fell away a little bit. Again, the other side of it, feeling a bit more like the Hollywood engine, is that, you know, the producers are going to come in, they're going to put their spin on it. It's called meddling, um, <laughs> you know, in, in, in a derogatory Another term, term. is yeah. producer meddling. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm still great friends with uh, Michael Luisi and Richie Lowell um, over at WWE. Um, we may be, as most producers and filmmakers do, clash a little bit creatively sometimes in the edit. Um, and a li little bit of that kind of happened. And, 
no hard feelings, man. It's just work. Um, yeah. I think a lot of that may be blown out of proportion in some circles. Um, but um, no, nah, man, I'd work with them again. I was, I was I, last time I went over to LA just before the pandemic. I sat yeah. down with them both, and just checked in and went, how are you guys doing? And da 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 da. Yeah, it's no hard feelings, man. It was, yeah. it, I, I wouldn't go back and change anything. I, I, I'm immensely grateful um, to Michael for taking a shot on me. He didn't have to. There's right. lots of directors could have got from over there. He saw something in me. He believed in me. He said he still believes in me. And he always has and he always will. Um, and that was the same for Sothcott. I'm, I, I can only thank those guys because without them, I would never have made, you know, those movies. And yeah. they gave me those, they gave me those opportunities, yeah. That's awesome. But question for you is, uh, were you a wrestling fan before you got into these movies? I I wasn't. Uh, the short answer is yeah. So, yeah. but not as an adult. So when yeah, I was yeah. a kid, I was I was big on you know nineteen nineties WWF. Yes. You right. know Jake the Snake, Jake the Snake, Big Boss yeah. Man, Lee the Doom, Ultimate Warrior, The Rockers. <laughs> um, so when I was a kid. I was big, man. Yeah, I loved the WWF, WWE. Yeah. Um, and then I think it wasn't really to do with growing up. I'd probably still watch it all now. Yeah. But like the NFL, because I was a big fan of, you know, I still am a big fan of the NFL. Right. Uh, and um, I think there was a certain period where it all got a little bit more difficult to watch over here. It was all getting more privatized. It was going on Sky. You had to subscribe. You had to pay for it. There yeah. wasn't the internet. You didn't have YouTube, so you could catch up on it or go to a sneaky streaming site, which we never do, do we? Yeah. And so um, um, there was there was none of that. And it yeah. kind of then isn't accessible and it falls away. It's That's... hard to keep up with what's going on. And I think that era of The Rock and Stone Cold Steve Austin and Edge, who I got yeah. to work with, was great. Um, I kind of m missed, you know, I didn't really... Um, yeah. But then when I got to work with Dean Ambrose on 12 rounds yeah. three, it kind of reignited my passion a little bit. And now I, I and it's more accessible now. And I, yeah. you've got the app and I check in on it a lot more. And I saw, I watched edges um, uh, return uh, during the, the, the Royal rumble. And um, that was unbelievable to watch. Cause he's like, he's kind of my mate. Yeah, and it, this with the risk, more the response, man. There's a footage in a bar, and this bar hears the first two notes of his tune, and their bar goes nuts. It was like England had scored against Germany, right? right. And, um, <laughs> and I was like, and I text him, I was like, Did you see? And he's like, Hey, man, always great to hear from you. Yeah, I'm back. Da, 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 da. <laughs> so, man, I'm texting Edge. This is great. Right. That's Keep weird. Touch. Don't be black, yeah. No. <laughs> that's weird that's really cool yeah i can imagine yeah being a wrestling fan and getting to actually work with them so that's weird oh, right. and yeah. then just the brand and that you know you walk into the studio wwe studios and there's the logo on the wall it's there. There's the, post <laughs> the posters from the movies um and and now you know 12 rounds when i went back 12 yeah. rounds it's there delegation <laughs> up there on the wall and you're like yeah you're part of this now <laughs> i'm a part of that now and, and that's always nice to um yeah always it's, i'm always gonna have that um yeah, and that beautiful feeling yeah that's cool sure. that's really cool uh, i wanted to find out a little bit more out of um out of mecca so i had a bit of a deep dive into um into the trailer a bit of behind the scenes i didn't get a chance to watch yet i watched like a couple of minutes but i, I was hooked and okay. <laughs> the thing that that's hooked me even more is um, earlier this year, I acquired a, a virtual reality <laughs> headset. So I've been using that quite a bit uh, throughout the pandemic, throughout lock By the way, I'm in Melbourne and we are the most locked down city in the world currently. So we, really? we, we've spent like, it's nearly like uh, all together, like this year and last year, it's, it's like nearly a year in like lockdown <laughs> so oh, wow it's okay, insane man, man. We've, we've been because gone obviously through... i yeah. i knew that um because i was developing another screenplay with some writers from australia right and i know that obviously from the news as well which i yeah. hardly watch thank god yeah. just for my own mental sanity and health Definitely. um that um th they were being exceptionally stringent um um <laughs> I don't know if that's questionable. I think 
strictness is great. And I was always an advocate of doing what was being asked throughout the pandemic yeah. because solidarity was the only way to really quell it. Yeah. And that's how you, uh, you know, viruses through quarantine um, until a vaccine comes along. Yeah. It's either dead simple or complicated. People made it complicated. People it's kept true. it simple. That was, I think, where the um, dichotomy yeah. came from. But views aside, that's uh, that must be tough, man. Yeah. Be tough. Is there is there light at the end of the tunnel? I mean, are you all getting vaccinated? Yeah, I think they're reaching like because I think the original goal was to like try and um, you know bring the numbers down all the way closer to zero, right? But now it's more about it let's get eighty percent of the you know state vaccinated that sort of thing and then we'll open it up and see what happens okay. um and that's kind of like what's going to happen now i think in, in the next month or so um but yeah we've just gone through these periods of like four months like lockdown open up wow. for a couple of months like close down for a week like you know things like that it's <laughs> but anyway I admire, I admire when there is a crisis like that i admire strictness and i admire self-discipline i admire yeah. the people that can go through it and get on with it and understand yeah. what's being done um rather than you know throw their toys out of the pram and nah, protest exactly. that. But, I mean, it, it is what yeah. it is yeah you gotta try and do the right thing and you know but yeah. what else can you do and you know what else can you do and you know the only way that you like i said something like that can be beaten is through you know uh, solidarity and everybody being yeah. on the same page um uh, and, and yeah i mean good luck man and good luck to all of us in in seeing it all through till the end because it still exactly. feels like it's lurking about like a big motherfucker threatening to know, ruin right. christmas well wow, so keeps ruining christmases um but yeah i've definitely like um definitely during all those lockdowns spent a lot of time playing some vr games and escaping the oh. lockdown as well so um okay. I've, I've i've dived into it i, I was wondering actually if you've you know, looking at Adam, um, you know, Adam Mecca and everything like that. Um, have you actually used VR quite a bit or have, what's your experience with it? And was that kind of an inspiration to it as well? Or how did you kind of come about the story? Um, no, I haven't. Hmm. So that's the short answer, but I do play a lot of Call of Duty. Of course. And that, that was certainly uh, one of the inspirations behind um um how out of mecca came to fruition yeah um in that i do a lot of work for an events company that run military simulation um events yeah. at certain um ministry of defense training villages it's an immersive um uh, military experience basically that sometimes the games run for 24 hours yeah. they're brilliant um, so I kind of got in with these guys and I cover their events and make them into movies so that, you know, punters can have yeah. copies of those um, to, 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 to take home, see themselves looking cool and <laughs> multicam. And um, uh, one day I had this new lens, like a wide angle lens that I was trying out and I just kind of popped it on the back of the gun. And I was like, listen, I'm going to go and take down this village, y'all. And I just messed about and, <laughs> And and when I, I was editing the footage and I forgot about that I'd done that and I was like, can that kind of works, man? You know, and this yeah. GH4 camera that I had, little Panasonic at the time, lightweight, mm. and I was like, hey, this, this this I've got access to these villages. Yeah, there's one in particular that looks really like Iraq. Mm. Let's see if we can get that. Let's see if we can do the military stuff as POV. I haven't really seen that. Um, in the way that I was going to do it without spoiling the ending because it's a big twist. Cool. And let's make the audience believe that we're in a virtual reality world. Yeah. So realistic and so uh, immersive and real looking, it, that technology can only be in the future. I'm like, okay, so now I have to set the real world in the future. And that's going to be immensely ambitious because... I'm shooting it myself as a cinematographer, which I've never done before. Um, but it's a great project for me to explore that because I was looking for that at the time. Yeah. I was also looking for a project for a young actor called Rory Nolan. Um, and it kind of all started to fit and come together until I then went, yeah, let's make this movie. Let's, let's, let's make it. I've written it into a mm. very strong, solid um, short film. 
um, which I've now adapted as a feature. It's a feature now, which is way better okay. um, and, and, and very different as well. Um, and let's just go and go and shoot it. And I always um, approach projects that I'm going to make myself in that way. Can we get that? Can we get that? Let's get that. OK, let's write a screenplay. While I'm writing the screenplay, can I get that? Can I get that? This all looks like I can get it all. Let's go. Why not? Yeah. Um, and um, it, it, it came together fairly quickly, but it was it was a, it was a massive a bit off more than I could chew, which I knew I was going to. Mm. In that, when I got back from the the interrogation and lockdown movies. Mm. I, again, as I mentioned earlier, I had a bit of an epiphany, a bit of a moment where I was like, nah, something, right. again, you know, like I said earlier, something's not right. This isn't how, this isn't the, the road I want to go down. Mm. You know, I almost imagine I'm at a fork in the road with some of these decisions and I go down there. And I, I don't, I don't kind of do that. I, I come back to this fork in the road then. Yeah. I probably should have went that way. It's, yeah. it's a dangerous thing to do um, because I haven't made a feature film for six years. Um, but again, that's the sacrifice and I stick to my guns and I've got to see it through. I, I was offered another WWE movie after interrogation and I kind of turned it down. And then there was a few other movies then of that ilk mm. that I was like, no, nah, these aren't the movies I want to be making man, now. Mm. Um, so I kind of went back to the drawing board, which is where I am now. Mm -hmm. um, but in that process out of Mecca, yeah. you know, came, came about, um, and I thought, you know, why not? You know, this this feels good. Just, you know, I make a lot of decisions based on instinct. Yeah. As much as I'm on set as I am in life. And um, I just loved the idea of it. Got excited, as I said. Mm. When I'm excited, you know, I can, I can make anything. Yeah. But what had been happening since after interrogation was that to go in another direction, I needed to reach out to new people. Um, and people weren't really picking up the phone after Vendetta anyway. L spoiler alert, they're still not picking up the phone. <laughs> um, um, so it's peaks and valleys, man, in this industry. But mm. certainly if I go back to the drawing board and start again, I'm not helping myself. But yeah. um, it, it's a mixture of, of two things. They weren't really picking up the phone before anyway. If someone did pick on the phone, I'd cap pick up the phone. I would capitalise on the opportunity. Um, I learned that with, you know, Vendetta and the WWE films, but uh, no one's, you know, been getting back to me. And so what I did was I went back to then how I started, which yeah. was writing not because I was like, making movies is a big engine and there's hundreds of people that need to move them parts. Mm. I need to collaborate with people to make movies. And that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to connect with producers. I'm trying to send out my screenplays see if there's projects that they want me to direct and um just not happening so i wrote these two novels one was called the redemption of alice dagger again escapism the most escapist realm ever so far away from my immediate coventry existence mm. was wild west wyoming in 1885 <laughs> so i wrote yeah. i wrote a western uh, but it was revenge western which is basically yeah. revenge with a female lead Ooh. in snowy Wyoming Interesting. With, like some, <laughs> with some horrendous torture revenge. So or revenge right. torture, <laughs> very much in the flavor of, you know, where I want to be going, but I'm never going to make that fucking movie right now <laughs> from, from, you know, Coventry where no one's picking up the phone. So right. I wrote it as a novel and I wrote it as a screenplay. And one day dream project to make, who knows? That's awesome. And, and, and then I wrote another one, which was a bit closer to home, called Prowler. Um, but what I'd gotten from those movies was a beautiful sense of understanding why I started getting into this game. Yeah. The, the, the escapism, the, um, the world building, the yeah. visiting the other realms, um, as we do with video games, as we do with movies as we do with stories, as we do with comic books. Yeah. Um, and we all get our fix different ways. Um, it might be watching The Shining 14 times or 
putting putting Love Island on repeat. <laughs> you know, we all get both great. Yeah, yeah, both great. Yeah, yeah. So um, um, I uh, that was, and then and then, long story short, when I'd finished those novels, I was like, how much of that can I do with a movie? Can yeah. if I can't get help to make movies, and I'm writing stories, that's just me and a computer. Mm. Can I do that with a movie? And that was what I kind of almost explored, experimented yeah. with, with Out of Mecca. And that was that was the approach. I just did it all myself because I can direct, I can write, I can edit, yeah. I can light and light and shoot. Um, and um, I just went for it, man. It's insane. It's very impressive. Like I was watching the um, behind the scenes, and like you've got the camera on you, like you're pulling the gun out, like you're doing, like you know, you're doing all the work as well. Like it's it's insane, and it looks it's a lot. Of, it looks like a lot of work to do, and like yeah, put your body out there, and like kind of and direct was, at the same time. You know, like you're directing yeah, everyone else. I mean, and... was, yeah, I mean that was the thing. I'm left-handed, and you know, when we right. play Call of Duty, our common association. I wanted to visually not have something off so if these guys are looking at a left hander it's uh, it's it's a small detail and it may have been superfluous but i was like i want them to n feel like they're watching that call of duty thing and right. and consciously if the guy's left-handed it might throw them off mm. again may have been superfluous so i retrained myself to use a rifle right-handed um wow. and do my speed changes you know clonk click in mag out yeah while i'm shooting while i'm trying to get the frame and you know doing it you know i've got good pistols lying around all over the place where are they like the punisher i've got them all in fucking six but all the guns uh, around you yeah one here, you know. <laughs> if you've got that you yeah, know you're left-handed i can't do that anyway because i'm left-handed so i have to if i do a mag change i have to swap anyway right yeah, yeah. so <laughs> And then I have to do that. I can't do a mag change left-handed. Yeah. So it's the same with the um, rifle. Yeah. You know, the release match is there. I'm, you know, if I do it at a game, I'm doing that. <laughs> and it's crap. It's not going to look right. So I was, you know, swapping the mags out. And But then crazy, you've got the camera on your head. And, Camera's right there. Yeah, it was, it was. But it was, you know what? It excited me because it was a challenge. How, yeah. how much of a challenge is that to be able to do that? And I, it, it galvanized me going forward with the project to know that who's done this before right uh, well, not no one really so um that excites me you know when someone's not really done something like that before as a filmmaker why not but yeah. then there's misconceptions it, you know it it can kind of look bad because people are then speculating why i'm doing that and the answers that they're coming up with is because i don't want to collaborate or work with people and right. so you're going around <laughs> a peculiar circle of i've tried to reach out and I'm dying with depression because people are rejecting me and not coming back to me. So I'm going to just do it myself. Yeah. And then the people that fill in the gaps go, he wants to do all of this himself because he doesn't yeah. want to collaborate and work with people. <laughs> Double-edged sword. <laughs> people go in, I'm damned if I do, I'm damned if I don't. So I just, mm. you just get on with it, don't you? But um, it was a, uh, it was hard work. The day of the military stuff was uh, hard. I was jumping over walls. I'm trying to keep stuff in frame. I'm trying to focus. I'm trying to shoot. Um, um, there's people coming out from left, right, and centre, and you've got to line them up and pretend you're shooting them because I did every muzzle flash myself because yeah. we didn't have live ammunition. Right. Um, and then you have to make it all look like one shot. So you know, because <laughs> yeah. no edits. You know, you know, you play Call of Duty. There's no, there's no edits. And sure. um, it got to all seem, you know, uh, sequential and seamless. So I'm hiding whip pans and making them up as I'm going along. And oh, I was fucked at the end of the day. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I can imagine. Bro. I was broken, bro. Um, <laughs> so, um, but loved it. Loved, loved making that movie. You know, it was tough. And um, yeah, unfortunately, when we were going for the big release and then hitting the film festivals, the pandemic came along. Right. Right, right on it. March. It was March. We were, there was the big push. Yeah. Boom, yeah. lockdown. And it's kind of fell into the ether man it's on youtube and you can watch it and fortunately yeah. that's kind of going to be where it lives now and yeah a it's, it's a lot of work for and i find that a lot with this industry it's a lot of work for not a lot of reward so you just got to take away whatever you can from it and yeah that's 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 a tough break without a mecca but we live and learn man 
Yeah, it looks super cool. I'll I'll have to hit you up once I watch it. Let you know what I think. Do it, man. I'd love to know what you think about it. I'd love to know what you think. Yeah. Yeah, it looks awesome. Um, well, Steve, I know I'm taking quite a bit of your time. Um, I thought I'll uh, wrap it up with a couple of quick fire questions just from the cool. team here yeah, from yeah. Fine Film, just to get get to know a couple of little little things about you. you. Already mentioned a couple of some of these. My first one is um, if I was to do a bit of fan casting on you and get you to direct a film. It's weird because I've written it down before we started um, talking, but I'd love to see you direct a RoboCop film. How oh. would you would you love to do that? How would you go about that? <laughs> I would absolutely love to do that. I think what what you cannot, what you can't not do with RoboCop <laughs> is play out the dark, um, sardonic comedy that is completely weaved yeah. underneath that movie throughout. There is a beautifully, um, Robocop is in its own right, a dark comedy. The yeah. darkest comedy at times when it wants to be. It's a beautiful parody of a future that we certainly in the 80s were moving towards. It mocked um, a society in its own way in terms of its intemperance and its corporate greed, its corporate greed um, yeah. and the absolute uh, length that, people will go to to make a quick book even if it's to basically ruin this cop's life in yeah. some respects you know? um but playing out more the uh, leaning into that i think the remake completely missed that mm. i think it's one of the values that robocop um has over no other dystopian futuristic movies sci-fi yeah. uh, action um and I would certainly go back to him being more of a um, robust mechanical uh, rather than this lean, sleek um, um, entity, I guess. Um, yeah. He was, he was, you know, super advanced. But I guess in the, in the, in the remake's defence, Robocop was always a, a reflection of, a futuristic reflection of where we are now. Mm. You know, technology is way more advanced now, so... They're going to try and create a RoboCop with fucking nanobite technology, yeah. and it's all going to be advanced from where we are now. Yeah. But it, I, I, you got to go back and kind of nod a little bit more to the to the rugged rawness of of, yeah. of what that eighties movie was. And yeah, no, that was awesome. I, I watched it as a little kid. Like my, as I told you, I grew up in Eastern Europe, and my parents didn't give a fuck about you know not showing us the the movies that we're not supposed <laughs> to watch. So yeah. I watched RoboCop, you know, Total Recall, like I loved all of those as a little kid and like, yeah. <laughs> and the violence as well, you know, the violence is totally within the realms and tone of what that movie was. And, you yeah. know, the, Robo, the RoboCop remake, essentially what they did was they tried to strip out everything that was great about certainly the screenplay mm. and really play it to more of a universal audience. It's, yeah. it's just... You know, it's just the Hollywoodization of True. a a you know, which is an adult. It's, a, it's an adult movie. That's why I loved The Punisher on Netflix. They didn't yeah. hold back on the violence, man. They right. did not hold back, and I respect them for that because that's what that comic is. If mm. you don't like it, don't watch it. Watch something else. But this is going to be grim across the board, man. There's going to be people getting their eyes shoved into their eye sockets. <laughs> you know, people getting jigsaw gets his face mangled. It's brutal, man. And sometimes you want to look away, but um. It's great. You've got to, you've got to honor the source, man. You've got to honor the source. It's a shame they cancelled that. Yeah, and it was Neil Blomkamp was going to do it, wasn't he? Yeah, I think so. Oh, sorry, sorry. The Punisher got cancelled, gutted, but the RoboCop remake, I think, was going to be Neil Blomkamp. And yeah, yeah. We're talking about two similar things. True. But yeah, yeah. Shame. Big yeah. <laughs> shit, bro. Next, next one is uh, three actors you'd love to work with. Who's kind of at the top of your list there? Uh, Denzel Washington, Anna Diarmis, and yeah, it's a tough one, man, isn't it? Like, <laughs> about a tough one. Names running hey, through my head. Those two are fantastic choices. <laughs> I'll, yeah, DiCaprio, I'd like to say man. that. Go, like, like DiCaprio or something, man. Like, yeah, just one of the bigger. Like, Tom, you know what? The, Tom Cruise gets a lot of shit, <laughs> and um, <laughs> just does. just as an experiment in what that process would be like in terms of mm. managing someone so big, someone with so much experience in the industry, understanding how he works True. would be a phenomenal learning experience 
it would probably break me to the point that I don't want to make movies anymore. <laughs> but I've always been curious about working with Tom Cruise. I just, uh, it, 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 yeah. it, he's an interesting man. And yes. just to watch his process would, would, would be <laughs> an education. <laughs> yeah, definitely. definitely. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, who's your favorite director working right now? Oh, wow. I'm a big fan of um, what Gareth Evans is doing, director of The Raid and yeah. you know, um, Gangs of London. And he's about to do a movie with Tom Hardy, which will be phenomenally interesting. We yeah. just mentioned him, um, Neil Blomkamp. I think he's the king of sci-fi at the moment. Yeah. I love Elysium. Um, a massive fan of, obviously, District 9. Yeah. Um, I'm a big fan of... Um, the guy that directed Midnight Special, believe it or not, yeah. Random, I think he did Murder, I think he did um, uh, what was it, the Take, Take Shelter. Yeah, uh, Jeff, Take Shelter's great. Jeff Nichols, yeah. yeah. Um, I'm always on the lookout for his movies because Midnight Special was a, just a completely underrated gem um, that, I, that I loved. But there are some names off the top of my head, I'm sure. I'll think of someone when I'm driving up the road later and be like, I really wanted to say that guy. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, yeah. I like that. I like that. I like those names. Um, what do you think of the current superhero? I guess we're in that kind of superhero movie era. Do you think it's going to last? What do you think of it? Um, I think, obviously, with the Avengers now cinematically kind of coming to, or, or, or that wave of, you know, yeah. cinematic, uh, movies, what was it, phase four or phase three? I guess we were in there at the end. Yeah. Um, I think that's going to maybe slow it down a little bit. It's just going to evolve and I think it's going to keep going. Um, there will always be children and children love superheroes. So yeah. there will always be superhero movies now. Um, and that's basically the short answer because that's the truth. You know, they really feed to that market. Us as adults, you know, we do get off on them. We do love them. We do weigh in on them. Yeah. Um, but they will always, that will always be a massive um, target audience for them, certainly yeah. in terms of merchandise as well. Um, and I think there will always be those movies. Um, and I enjoy them. You know, I don't think, I don't think they're, I don't think they're in a place where, I mean, it depends on them. Um, but I don't think they're in a place where, I guess it's it's the you know scraping the bottom of the barrel at the moment. Right. Um, I think there's just going to be a new movement. I think there's going to be a bit of a lull at the minute, you know, because everything's kind of gone to streaming. We've had Loki. We've had it's all becoming TV, obviously. True. Falcon and the Soldier, which I loved. Right. Um, you know, Black Widow now, um, and um, I think it might kind of dip a little bit. Dip a bit. In terms because because the Avengers movies, man, everyone's like yeah. everyone was. <laughs> hungry for these things man Thor Ragnarok and then that's going to lead into them and, yeah, and uh, yeah. Captain America Winter Soldier's then going to come into the and then that's going to lead to that and I think <laughs> we're all like chomping at the bit for the next Good. one and you know Civil War and Endgame and oh it was it was yeah. a, it was a wonder for me it was a wonderful time to be alive and experience that yeah. as they were coming because I, I think it'll be a long time before we get that again because yeah. that was a, I've never experienced that in cinematic history in all the ages I've been you know, right. going to the cinema in the way that it was like, it was like a TV series <laughs> on the big screen for That's 10 cool. years. Yeah. yeah, 10 years of a TV show. Uh, it was, it, it, I, I did enjoy being a part of that. Yeah. Um, be interesting to see where it goes. Yeah, it's probably, it's probably never happened really before like that. I, there's probably a bit of fatigue at the moment, but who knows? Maybe this uh, this new Batman film, I'm not too sure if you're a big Batman fan or not, but maybe that's going to, people are going to be, you know, excited for that as well maybe it's not going to die but is it a new Batman movie or is it the fact that is this the the we're seeing michael Keaton? oh no sorry obviously the robert pattinson one oh, yeah. This, yeah right there's gonna be two yeah well i immediately started thinking about michael keaton showing up in the new um yeah, flash well, that's, movie. that's gonna be something probably as well. more excited about than um yeah. the 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 batman matt yeah, reeves yeah. is the batman. but um it's funny because i sat down and i've got it in my notes right here on my phone and I had started to put into my iPhone, as I do when I have just notes and ideas. Um, and it's, it's essentially Batman's Last Night. It's kind of based on the video game 
um, Arkham Origins, which is yeah. one of my favourite video games. Right. A proper robust post-industrial Gotham that's decaying, which is not really Ar- Arkham Origins. I'll put that spin on it. Mm. It's Christmas Eve. It's it, and and it's an old weathered Batman, but it would have been Michael Keaton in a beat-up suit from the 1989 suit out to get the Joker one last time. It's called Last Night. That's Batman awesome. carks it in the end, and that was I'd written that down as a note, and then. Two years later, or it wasn't even that. It's about six months later. Michael Keaton's about, to, and I'm like, 20, 30 years. I had this idea six months ago. I'm yeah. sure everyone's had that idea to see Keaton again, man, but yeah, yeah it was, it was, I'm excited. But to yeah, see. yeah, excited is not the word. Yeah, can't wait. Yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, what advice would you give a younger, a younger Stephen Reynolds? Are you a younger filmmaker or an actual younger Stephen Reynolds? I, I think for yourself. Yeah. So I, so I go back in time. I fantasized about this since Back to the Future. You love time back, travel. You love sci-fi. Uh, I'm going back to see him. Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, I'm, I'm laughing because there is stuff going through my head, but I can't say it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, regards to filmmaking uh you know look um in in fear of completely destroying the space-time continuum and you know (laughs) uh, and uh, and causing the butterfly effect i would not i would not try not to say anything uh because the slightest thing you say would change that's the more scientific approach yeah but more of yeah um i would say just keep doing what you're doing and keep going and i know sometimes it gets hard but everything that you are doing, whether you whether it's good or bad, you are learning, and life teaches you these experiences. And 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 you know, even if it's tough sometimes, you know, there's always light at the end of the tunnel. So just keep going and keep pursuing that that dream because I still don't know where it's going to take me. I'm a baby, and um, Clint Eastwood's making movies at 90 years old, so it's still in front of me, and it's still in front of you. So just keep doing what you're doing, sunshine, and um brush your teeth more <laughs> all of that you ain't been doing look at this now do that. uh yeah that's what i tell him yeah great great advice i love it <laughs> i love it <laughs> well great steve thank you so much for coming on man um just for the listeners out there um vendetta 12 rounds three lockdown interrogation um as well as out of mecca all those i guess worldwide probably people can access those through youtube is probably the easiest way to kind of rent it and have a have a watch um sure. where can people kind of follow your journey and kind of uh keep up to date with what you're doing yeah i suppose um i'm on twitter now and again reynolds films pretty straightforward um at reynolds films and then um i kind of dip in and out of instagram now and again um that's reynolds films imagery all one word and that's kind of just where i post because i've got a side hustle thing where i do lots of photography and and sort of kind of corporate films and there's, there's, there's stuff from my movies and that that I post on there now and again. Yeah. Not so much in terms of personal stuff. Um, um, so, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Reynolds Films imagery on Instagram and just Reynolds Films on Twitter, man. Come and give me a follow and see where this journey's heading because <laughs> I know about as well as you guys do where it's going and uh, hopefully we can all get that together, yeah. Definitely. I'm super excited, man. I'm super excited. Well, any plans to come down to Australia? Oh, do you know what? It was my dad's number one place to go in the world, man. My dad's yeah. passed away years ago, but my dad's one place in the world was go to, was to go to Australia. Yeah. He was a huge fan of um, a national treasure that you've got down there who was a country and Western singer called Slim Dusty. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of him. I don't know how famous <laughs> he is or was down there. Is, is, he a, is he a, was he or is he a name? You would, would, would everybody know who he is or not? Probably, I, it doesn't ring a bell. I know John Williamson. I'm not too sure if you're familiar with that one, but no, no, he was he's he, really he was a awesome random songs. one, man. But yeah, yeah he was. Uh, when the rain tumbles down in July, and all of these songs used to play when he was <laughs> drunk in my house and during my childhood. But uh, yeah, Australia, oh. man. I, I, it's 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 ne- it's it's next on the list. I'd say it's pretty high on the list because. My number one place to go in my life was to go to Alaska. And it's rare that you get to go to that one place in the world that you get to go to. And I did once. Um, and I was out there filming dog sledding and all of this stuff. And it was amazing. Hmm. Where do you want to go next? Someone asked me, I said, Hong Kong. And I managed to go out there and do some corporate stuff. <laughs> LA was next. 
Um, and to be honest, my Australia keep yeah keeps popping up in conversations with me and the missus. So um, hopefully, if we're I know it's a big place, but if we do land in Melbourne, in you know, uh, hopefully we can go for a coffee, and I'll definitely keep so. you posted. But it's on the list, man, and it's coming. Hopefully, when things get a bit more sane <laughs> in the world, and I can get on a plane again, yeah, definitely. I look forward to it, man. I look forward to it. Uh, awesome. thanks once again Stephen really really appreciate you coming on it was uh, great chatting to you mate um, hopefully we can do it again sometime with your, with your next project definitely man definitely thank you so much and it was great perfect cheers man all the best cheers bro